Right, having explained the units, that means we can write our Hamiltonian in this form. Really nice, simple form. And I'm putting the little hats on. You could argue that the hat on the X is superfluous, because the, uh, the X operator is just X. For reasons I just want to keep clear, particularly because we're going to be doing some operator manipulations and it's very important to not get confused between operators and standard variables. I'm going to leave those hats on um, throughout because otherwise it's, you know, operators don't always and often don't commute, whereas multiplication of standard variables does commute. And if we don't put the hats on, it's very easy to get confused. So I'm going to leave the hats on. And that's what a Hamiltonian looks like in natural units. In units, h bar is equal to m is equal to 1. So we look at this Hamiltonian. We could try a brute force. Let's guess a trial solution. Let's try and extract out what the eigenfunctions are, what the eigenvalues are. And as I mentioned, there's this power, what's called power series approach to do that. We're instead going to use a mathematical trick, a really elegant mathematical trick. We look at this. And we go, well, okay, if those were just numbers, if they were just variables, standard variables, we could factorize this. They're not variables, they're operators, so we have to be careful in terms of the order in which we apply them. But can we factorize this, or can we do something that looks like factorization? Well, we can do something that looks like factorization. We can't quite factorize it, but we can get it, get, get it factorized to the point where it's very, very helpful. What we're going to do is we're going to define two, two operators, two new operators, called the raising and the lowering operator. The reason we call them the raising and lowering operator will become clear very soon, but actually I can explain it right now. What, what these operators do, and they are operators I've got to stress in terms of a mathematically pure sense. They are not Hermitian operators that we can use to operate on the wave function or the state cat and return back observables. The raising and lowering operators are not that type of operator. They're non-Hermitian operators that are basically a mathematical trick that allows us, that allow us, to convert one eigenfunction into another. They allow us to go either go up the steps of the vibrational ladder or to go down those steps. So we have a raising operator, which takes, for example, the ground state, converts it into the n equal to 1 state, or the n equal to 1 state into the n equal to 2 state. And then we have a lowering operator that takes the n equal to 2 state, converts it into the n equal to 1, etc. Once we have the energy eigenfunctions, or eigenkets, we can then use those to find out the, the eigenvalues. So let's define what those raising and lowering operators are. So I'm going to put a hat, I'm going to call it A, and conventions differ. Now I'm going to use a convention that's used by Griffiths and also used in a great set of notes by somebody called Daniel um, Schroeder, which I linked to a number of times in, in the quantum world notes. And I'm going to use a plus and a minus. Plus to represent a raising operator, minus to represent a lowering operator. So our raising operator is given by, and our lowering operator is represented by this. Operators, remember. So I'll just be clear here, raising. lowering. And just how it does this will become clear soon. One thing I should, before we go any further, let me just get rid of this. In terms of the momentum operator, what I am talking about is this, but I'm just, for clarity, I'm not going to carry around that subscript. So in this case, when I talk about, when I use this, I'm talking about the momentum operator in terms of the x, because we're only working in the x direction, in the x dimension. Let's take the product of these two things, these two operators. Oh, let me put the hat on, I forgot already. So that will give us minus 
pi over 2. Can we see all that? I hope so. Just about. I'll probably stick it on in a nice transparent gift. Okay. This, hopefully you recognize as a half x squared plus a half p squared, is our Hamiltonian. So the product of these two operators gives us a Hamiltonian back plus this term. And this, hopefully you remember, is a commutator. And if you remember back to somewhere in chapter four, what that will be, will be I h bar. Commutator between position and momentum is I h bar. However, we're setting our units so that h bar is equal to m is equal to one. So this thing is one, h bar is one. Which means that so we get a nice simple result. And that's the reason we get this nice simple clean result. One of the reasons is that we're using natural units, so it just makes things a lot clearer. Now they're operators, so the order matters. So I want you to apply the operators the other way around, that what you get is your Hamiltonian minus a half. Do that. Work through it's exactly the same logic as I've used here, but make sure you can show that, help you understand just what's going on and keep you on top of things. The whole reason we've introduced these raising and lowering operators is because we claim that if we apply the raising operator to an eigenfunction, we get the next eigenfunction up. So if we apply it, as I've said, to the n equal to 1 state, we get the n equal to 2 state. So if we write that down, Time independent Schrodinger equation. We're applying a Hamiltonian to our eigenfunction. We're getting our eigenfunction back times the energy eigenvalue. What we are claiming is that the raising operator takes us from this particular eigenfunction to the next highest eigenfunction of the ladder. And that next highest eigenfunction, remember, when we had the ladder at the start, I'll put it back here, there we go, da ding So if you look at the, the ladder of states, we're going up in terms of natural units by one natural unit each time. So what the raising operators, what our claim is, is that the raising operator does this. Operating on U is we get, that's effectively the next highest eigenfunction associated with the next highest energy eigenvalue. I hope that makes sense. All we're doing is we're applying the time independent Schrodinger equation. In this case we've got our eigenfunction u and we're turning eigenfunction u. The raising operator brings us one step up on the ladder. So if this was u0 for example this would become u1. And the, um, that means it's got an energy eigenvalue in our natural units of E plus 1, if this is E. It's, it's really neat and really elegant and really compact in terms of this operator approach. Okay, so that's what we claim. Let's just apply the operators and make sure that what we claim is actually the case. Okay, let's show this. Where am I on the board? So we're applying our Hamiltonian to our raised eigenfunction. But we've already shown that a Hamiltonian can be written like this. So what we're going to do now is insert that Hamiltonian in here. And what we'll have is our raising operator followed by our lowering operator plus a half. All of that operating on raising operator operating on new. Or U is our eigenfunction. Okay, let's do the operations here. So, we've got that, followed by that, followed by that, plus a half that operation. All of that operating on U. And what we end up with is 
operating on Now what we have, and this is our Hamiltonian, this one, we plug that in there, then what we have is our Hamiltonian plus one times u. Remember what the left hand side of the equation actually was, let me write that down. So what we've shown is that that is equal to Where does that get us? Well, like we know as well, that's the case. So, what that tells us is that now let's just write that, rearrange that, that's just a constant. can change the order around like this and then a slightly better TypeScript we've got that look at what this is this is telling us that when our this is exactly the result we wanted and exactly the result we claimed in that a Hamiltonian operates on an eigenfunction that's been raised by the raising operator so if this is un then the raising operator will give us un plus one gives us back that raised eigenfunction times an eigenvalue which is exactly one unit higher. So we've shown that the raising operator does indeed do what it says on the tin. It raises us up that ladder of vibrational energy levels and vibrational eigenfunctions. It's neat, isn't it? I, I hope you think it's elegant and neat because I certainly do. I, it's, it's really, uh, Griffiths, as I said, described it as a diabolically elegant. And I think that's a beautiful description of something like this. It's, it really is very, very neat mathematics and neat mathematical physics. And we haven't even really got to the good part yet. And these raising and lowering operators are powerful tools, of course, as we're seeing when it comes to simple harmonic oscillator, but they underpin a great deal of quantum field theory as well. Don't worry, we're not going into quantum field theory. You'll find out about quantum field theory later quantum field theory later on in the in the course, if you choose the appropriate modules. Um, but they although we can't apply these raising and lowering operators or this idea to other one-dimensional potentials, you know, we can't apply it to the infinite but square infinite potential well or the finite potential well, simply because we just don't have that half x squared plus a half p squared symmetry, as it were, in the Hamiltonian. So in that case, it's limited to the simple harmonic oscillator, but because the simple harmonic oscillator is so prevalent across nature, anything we develop for the simple harmonic oscillator is really important for so many other things. But it is neat, isn't it? Right. What I now want you to show, and you can use exactly the same logic as I've just used, is this. If we have that and the raising, the lowering operator pulls us down one step on that ladder of vibrational states. Show that. Show that that's the case, using the same logic that I've just used to, to work through for the raising operator. Now we've got a question, and here's where the link between the physical logic and the mathematical logic really is beautiful. We've now got a bit of an issue in principle, or it seems like we've got a bit, bit of an issue in that, wh where does the bottom rung fall? Do we have a bottom rung? Can we just keep dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping? Why does it bottom out? This is the raising and lowering. Why doesn't the lowering operator, when I drew the diagram of the vibrational states, I stopped at n equal to zero. There's no real reason for the mathematical machinery to stop there. Why can't, why can't we keep going down? Now, if you think about that in terms of why can't we just keep dropping energy and dropping down energy indefinitely, physically we can't have that. Because if we could do that, we'd have something that is the holy grail of a large fraction of strange quarters of the internet. We'd have a perpetual motion machine. Because if we can keep dropping and emitting energy and emitting energy with no lower bound, then we've got an infinite source of energy. Obviously, the laws of thermodynamics tell us that 
we get no free lunches. We, we're, we're not going to get a perpetual motion machine regardless of what certain denizens of certain YouTube channels and certain Reddit fora, forums, fora, fora, I think, um, tell us we, we that's not going to happen. And of course, quantum mechanics tells us exactly the same thing. What we're effectively saying is that there could be no negative energy eigenvalues. Let's deduce that mathematically. So as ever, our starting point is here which we've just had. Alternatively, uh, equally well, we have that. Where that's the eigenvalue associated with this eigenfunction. These are ortho orthogonal, orthonormalized, so that's equal to E. That should not come as a big surprise. We're in this eigenstate, eigenket, eigenfunction, and all those words you can swap around as much as you like, they pretty much mean the same thing. That means we get the expectation value for the Hamiltonian, let me put a hat on it. In that state, we're gonna get the expectation value for the energy, but we're in an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, so we're gonna get the eigenvalue associated with that eigenstate. Nothing new there. However, let's just think about this integral a little bit more. So, we're going to swap now between the bracket notation and the integral notation. So this is what I meant before about swapping between matrix mechanics and wave mechanics. It can be very, very helpful. So what we're saying is this. What's that? Well, that is going to be this integral. I'll drop the x if it's okay, just to, to keep things clear. By our Hamiltonian. Drop the x in terms of putting brackets in this. This this is a function only of, the, of x, okay? Um, right, so what's a Hamiltonian in this case? Keeping with natural units, just to keep everything nice and straightforward, we've got a half p squared plus a half x squared. Is that fitting on? Why well, it is for a change? Okay, so what we then have are two uh, integrals Let's make the script a little bit easier to read. Looks like that. So you've got two integrals there. Now I want you to do this yourself. It's not beyond, mathematically, it's not beyond anything you've done before. And show you need to integrate by parts that you get this equation, 7 down 2, 6, in the notes. Now the first term in this equation, if we have a physically realistic, if we have a physical solution, then that must be normalizable, which means it must go to zero at plus or minus infinity. Hence, we can lose this term. We're left with the other terms. And we can write those like this. I want you to work this through for yourself. You'll learn a lot more if you try to follow these through, to try to actually derive these steps for yourself. If you can't, obviously get in touch and I'll give you hints and help you, help you through it. But it's very much worth trying to do it. So we end up with this. Now the important point here is that these two, the integrands here, in those two terms, have to be positive. They just have to be, mathematically, they have to be positive. In other words, energies, energy eigenvalues, have to be greater than or equal to zero for a physically acceptable wave function, for a physically acceptable eigenfunction, for a physically acceptable solution. So it's good to see that what we respect on the basis of our physical intuition actually plays out in the mathematics. That we can't have perpetual motion machines, we can have no negative energy eigenvalues, which means there's a ground state. It's a stable ground state, which is the bottom rung of, of the ladder. This condition means that when we, tr when we hit the bottom rung of the ladder, say we're coming down from the n equal to 5 state, we apply the lowering operator. 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Once we get to that n equal to zero state, if we apply the lowering operator, we're not gonna get a physical state. 
which means one of two things. Either that state is unnormalizable and there's one of the challenge questions on worksheet eight, which is actually, I've got to admit, stolen directly from Griffiths's book. That means we're left with one other possibility, that when we apply the lowering operator, what we get is zero. We know what the lowering operator is, and therefore, if the lowering operator operating on a function gives us zero, then we've got a differential equation that turns out we can solve very, very straightforwardly using A-level mathematics. It's a beautiful, this is why Griffiths calls it diabolically clever. There's the ladder operators themselves, which is a wonderful idea, the idea of trying to factorize the Hamiltonian and end up with these raising and lowering operators, which take you up and down the ladder. That idea is really neat. But then this next bit as well, or this bit that we're working on now, I also find really elegant. What we're saying is that when we hit that lowest rung of the ladder, when we apply the lowering operator, we're not going to get a physically valid state. It turns out that that state has got to be equal to zero. So that means we can write down operating on the lowest, and let's put a zero on there to define that we're talking about the lowest rung of the ladder now, and we're saying that's equal to zero. So I hope you find this next bit as, as elegant as, as I do, it's, um, and certainly as Griffiths and many others do. What we're saying is this, we take our lowering operator, we apply it to the bottom rung of a ladder, the eigenfunction there, which is we're going to call u0 to highlight that it's the n equal to zero state, and that's equal to zero. So, well, what is this operator? Well, we wrote that down right at the start, it's this. Now let's apply it. So we've got one over root two, x plus ip, operating on u0 equals zero. What's a momentum operator? That looks a bit more like a row, sorry. That's a bit more like a p. What's a momentum operator? Well, in our natural units, it's just minus i d dx. Apply that twice. Well, what we're going to get is I um, by minus I gives us minus I squared, so this gives us a positive. Move it up the board, which in turn is a beautifully simple differential equation, because what we've got is x u zero is equal to du, sorry, plus du zero dx is equal to zero, implies du zero dx is equal to minus x u zero. Okay, let me, just to be clear, that's a function. And in better TypeScript, we got that. You've solved differential equations like this before many times. Solve it and show that what you have for the solution and if this looks familiar this Gaussian looks familiar and causes you to break out in a cold sweat that's because it featured heavily in coursework one because you were working with the eigenfunctions of the simple harmonic oscillator so it's hardly surprising it pops out but isn't that neat just from Ensuring that we don't break the laws of thermodynamics just from ensuring that from pure physical common sense that we've got to have a ground state that we can then apply our operator to that ground state knowing that we're not going to get a physically realizable solution if we try to go lower than zero and out pops a solution. I, I think that's just really neat as you might have guessed. Um, so that's our eigenfunction. If you then plug it into, you could take that, normalize it, plug it into the time independent Schrodinger equation, pull out the eigenvalue, or you can do something which is just a little bit more straightforward and again quite elegant. We know 
even without working out what u0 is, we know that this holds for u0. Time independent Schrodinger equation. Uh, let me put, let me be clear, put it there like that. So this is the, for n equal to zero, energy eigenvalue, n equal to zero energy eigenfunction. Um, what's a Hamiltonian? Well, we know a Hamiltonian. It's this, which is Think carefully about this. You can do this in your head. Bear in mind what I've just discussed over the last couple of minutes and show that the energy eigenvalue E0 is a half. I know students hate when lecturers go, you can do this by inspection, but just think carefully about this. Think about what these were operating, these operators are operating on this function. What have I just said? about when we operate on the lowest, the ground state, the lowest rung of the ladder. Think about that, and out pops this result immediately. Remember that our energy units, as I said right at the start, are h bar omega zero. So in natural units, which we've worked through throughout, if we now want to plug it back into standard units, that's what we have. E zero is equal to half h bar omega zero. So if we kick off with our ground state, we can use a raising operator to find the next eigenfunction, and then the next eigenfunction, and the next eigenfunction, and the next eigenfunction. And if we do that, what we get is this. So these are the different eigenstates of the simple harmonic oscillator potential. Also included in there is the simple harmonic oscillator potential, <laughs> the half kx squared, and also those dashed lines show the limits in terms of where for a classical oscillator, how far it's going to move back and forth. And you can see that for the quantum oscillator, it moves beyond those limits. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but just for completeness, here's what the mathematical expressions of the energy um, eigenfunctions uh, look like. What we have is our Gaussian each time multiplied by what's called a Hermite polynomial. Now, so Hermite polynomials, if you're interested, you can look it up. We're not going to be going into Hermite polynomials beyond the fact that they appear as the solutions to the simple harmonic oscillator potential. Um, they're famous in mathematics. They fall out naturally in terms of the uh, operator ladder operator approach we've used. As I've said, there are other more tedious approaches to do that, but notice that we've got a Gaussian multiplied by a polynomial each time, and that defines our um, eigenfunction. Okay. One last thing to do with regard to the simple harmonic oscillator.